but uh, Philip will take it away here. All right. So today uh, I want to talk a little bit about some fun you can have uh, with aerial hacking drones. Uh, this is an extension and a system that I've been working on for the last year and a half. Um, and this is me. I work somewhere, and I'm on Twitter, and I have a website. So imagine that. Uh, so what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about hacking and forensics with small, low-power devices, things that you can run off a battery. And in particular, I'm going to use the ARM-based BeagleBoard, BeagleBone family of uh, boards. And we'll talk about how you can perform coordinated attacks with multiple hacking drones. Uh, and of course, uh, the real fun stuff is why don't you put all that stuff on a little airframe and fly it in to your target? We're really good at that in this country lately, aren't we? Drone strike, yeah. Why should, why should the government get all the money? Uh, why, why would you care about all this stuff anyway? Uh, I developed a full featured Linux distro, uh, and it runs on low power devices. You can actually run one of these devices for a couple days off of standard batteries. Uh, you can plant these devices and retrieve them later. Uh, you can network these devices. You can hack from up to a mile away. Uh, and could possibly be even across the world if you use a couple gateways. Um, and the aerial drone is a little bit of fun because you can use it for some initial recon. You can kind of do a flyby, uh, initial, see what kind of networks and stuff like that are around kind of thing. And in some cases, it might be your only practical way to get in there and get at your target, depending on where they are. And so, you can also land it nearby. This uh, particular airframe is capable of vertical takeoffs and landing, so you can do things like, you know, park it on the roof for a little while, a couple days. Uh, There's not all of them, but um, first off, the Raspberry Pi is not as powerful. Uh, you can't run Ubuntu on it because it's got some ancient not really open uh, ARM processor. Broadcom won't tell you about it. You can't run Ubuntu on it because Canonical doesn't want to deal with it. It's so old. Uh, it's not really as mature. The, even though the BeagleBone Black's only been out for six months, the BeagleBone's been out much longer, and the BeagleBoard's been out even longer than that. And they're all using the same basic stuff. Uh, and it actually costs more to build with the Raspberry Pi. By the time you're done, uh, it's going to cost you more. I know that uh, I talked to the folks at the Beagle Board organization. They sell boards to distributors for $35, and they list for $45, so you can get them for less. Uh, the Raspberry Pi lists for $35, and the sold to distributors for $35. So surprise, surprise, it's hard to buy them for list price. Um, the Pi is still hard to get, especially in the U.S. The week after the Black Bingo Bone Black came out, uh, my son destroyed my prototype board, and I actually was able to buy some more. Um, I didn't get on a waiting list or anything like that. Um, also, the uh, Beagle is a lot more power efficient and more reliable. Um, and uh, there's not as much general purpose I.O. on the Pi, so I thought that was kind of limiting for stuff we're doing. Uh, Pi's a little bit fragile, and it's not as compact. You've got pins that are easily bent and broken, as opposed to headers and things like that. So these are just some of the reasons why they use the Pi. So, um, all right, so an aircraft. What were my goals for choosing an aircraft? I wanted something to have a good payload so I could take all my hacking stuff. Something that could fly outside of the wind. Uh, something that could do vertical takeoffs and landings. Something that had a reasonable flight time and space for the people in black. 
space for XB, radios, space for an alpha adapter, and it was affordable. Again, affordable professor, right? And of course, this is kind of less dramatic since I had it sitting on the stage, but here's the winning, winning aircraft. Um, this is a quad shot. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, I chose it because it met those goals very well. Um, you know, the quad shot is a flying wing with vertical takeoff and landing capabilities. Uh, you can fly with wind. Uh, some of you probably like to play with uh, quadcopters, and they're lots of fun. They tend not to have great payloads, and they tend to be almost unflyable in any real wind. You take them outside, and you know, there's a five mile an hour breeze, and it's just, it's going everywhere. The other thing, if you're flying with something like a quadcopter, it's not terribly energy efficient, right? Because you're using raw power to keep you up in the air all the time. Whereas if you fly something like quad shot in airplane mode, uh, you're going to get a lot more efficiency out of that because you're just gliding around. Things. Um, also, uh, some models of the quad shot use XB for communications, so there's actually a slot to put in an XB adapter. It's got a built-in camera mount, so it seemed like a, a good platform. It's also fairly affordable, uh, the platform with a controller and all that, uh, unassembled is about 400 bucks. So some of the other quadcopters are a little bit more. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the deck. Your new favorite distro. Uh, originally, this is something I designed to run on the BeagleBoard XM. Uh, I actually presented it here last year, a week after I presented it in London when it debuted. Um, and it's been ported to the BeagleBone Black, also runs on the original BeagleBone. Uh, it's optimized for the Beagles. It's not, I don't want to say half-assed, but a halfway port of some desktop software. I started with the Beagle, and I wrote pen testing stuff for the Beagle. I didn't just go, hey, I have this desktop Linux, let me just kind of make it, see if it runs on this. Um, so it's nice, you can use it as a desktop, or you can use it as a drone. So it's nice to have that flexibility. Um, there's over 1,600 packages in the deck. It's based on Ubuntu. Uh, the latest version is based on Ubuntu 13.04. It, I like Ubuntu because it's got good repository support, good community support, uh, and it makes things a little bit easier if you're going to make a distro, things like that. Um, also, I'm running the latest kernels. So I'm running like a 3, I think a 3.8.12 kernel or something like that is what I'm running on these devices. Okay. Uh, real quickly, if you, if you came to my talk last year, you saw some of these, but I just wanted to show you the kinds of things that you can do with one device running the deck. Right? So, the first thing you can do is everyone's favorite exploit that just turned five. Everyone saw that, right? MS 0867, turn five. Anyone go to a party? <laughs> Somebody went to the fifth birthday party? Okay. Um, so, yeah, here I'm, I'm running up. Uh, Looks like Nmap, and I'm also running Metasploit, and it's like, oh look, something's running at port 445. Let me try MSO 8067, and of course, boom, it works. So I don't know how hard it is to, to read that, but you know, I've got a, a show on an XP box. Um, other things that you could do. Uh, wireless cracking. I was really glad to see all the wireless cracking uh, in the wireless village here. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, by the way, just a little side note. I, I hosted a B-Side, B-Side's Iowa in the spring, and I designed this whole Wi-Fi competition. Guess how many entries I got? None. Nobody, I, I even threw a couple of web networks out there, you know, it's like, wow, nobody, nobody tried, and they're like, oh, it's going to be hard, some elite hacker is going to kick my ass in this competition, but it's like, 
Well, nobody competed, so nobody won. So, all right, so, uh, you know, here I'm uh, cracking a WPA2 network, which has got, you know, some lame passwords, and, you know, I can see what's running, and <clears throat> sure enough, I don't know, can you see that? I think the password is password one or something stupid. Yeah, password one. What's the password? <clears throat> Other um, things you can do with the deck, of course, you've got all your favorite password uh, cracking tools like Hydra and uh, X Hydra if you like graphical stuff. And so here, you know, I passed, I, I cracked a, another password for a router, which once again, somebody used password. Well, what if you have somebody that has better password policies, and they don't allow password one, <clears throat> then you want to use some WPS cracking. Do you want to start there? No, right? Because this can take forever, right? This can take a couple days, unless you get lucky. And if you get real lucky, it might take a couple minutes. But, um, so yeah, you, know, you can go ahead and I poured it over Reaver, so it seems to work fine. And you know, you can crack passwords with Reaver. Um, how many people have used Reaver? A couple of you. How many have had a little difficulty with Reaver? Yeah, it's usually kind of a balancing act, right? You you have to balance trying to crack the password right away with if you have a good router, it'll say, hey, you can a lot of WPS requests. I should throttle them back. Right, so if you, you can go just fast enough to not get throttled and detected. Um, and the other thing is, if it's a cheap router and you hit it really hard, it just crashes and then you never crack it. Well, okay, maybe you crack it after they go, hey, well, my internet's gone and they reboot. Other things you can do, uh, again, using Metis Point, I call this Pony Windows 7 like a Mac. Not like a boss, but uh, using that Java exploit that the Macs were famously pwned with, you know, hundreds of thousands of them in early 2012. And of course, the same vulnerability was on everyone's PCs, and they were all like, oh, look at you. And it's like, oh, no, guess what? Just pwned you as well. So, so sure enough, I have a shell here and it says Windows 7 and I think it says something like University Redacted at the prompt, so we'll just move on. Right. Um, other things, you can uh, use Fern. Who's to use Fern in here? Okay, yeah, it's a nice GUI tool. It's for what I call Click Kitties. And I don't see Aaron, but Aaron and I co-own the trademark for Click Kitty. Uh, Click Kitty is lower than the Script Kitty, right? And script Kitty can download scripts and run them, and the Click Kitty has to only click on GUI stuff. All right, so uh, it, it is kind of a nice tool if you're lazy. Uh, you can you can just say, oh, here's some networks. Oh, I want to attack this one, and it'll tell you when it's done. Right? It's kind of like Armitage. Uh, I was doing a, a hacking class last year and I had somebody, I said, well, what are you doing? What are you trying to do against this target? He's like, I don't know. I just clicked. <laughs> you never want to tell a professor that. It's, it's not a good thing. All right, so let's talk a little bit about 802.15.4 networking. Uh, 802.15.4, sometimes called XB, or if you're doing mesh networking based on it, Zigbee networking. Um, we'll talk about basics some simple cases, and some slightly harder cases, and, and all that good stuff. All right, so some basics. Typically, XB is used in low power embedded systems. You can get different XB adapters. You can get regular ones that are good to about 300 feet, and you can get pro adapters that are good to about a mile. They have two modes of operation. You can either use them in AT mode, 
also known as transparent mode, or API mode. Uh, pretty low speed, 250K, but good enough for command and control type stuff. Uh, supports peer-to-peer, -peer, star networks, and mesh networks. So it's pretty flexible. Uh, here's just a partial listing of some of the different types of devices. Uh, there's different frequency spectrums you can use. Uh, probably in this country you want to use 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, but mostly I just wanted to show this chart as a reminder. When you're buying these, there's something like 30 different kinds. Buy the right kind. Okay? Don't try to mix and match, or it's not going to work so well for you. So Digi makes these things. They're up in Minnesota, and they have the regular Pro formats, as I said. Um, the only difference is, if you look in the corner, you'll see a Pro adapter. It's a little bit longer, but they plug into the same socket. They will work together, and they're completely interchangeable. The only real difference is the power requirements. The regular ones are 50 milliamps and the pro ones are 295 milliamps. Right? So six times the power, um, which is relevant if you're battery powering your device. Um, one thing that's kind of a pain in the butt, if you want to make your own adapters for these, they use two millimeter spacing instead of tenth of an inch or 2.54 millimeter spacing, so you probably have to get an adapter unless you buy a cape for your big alone. We'll talk about that later. Uh, there's different antenna options. And again, don't mix like Series 1 adapters and Series 2 adapters, also sometimes called ZB adapters. They won't interrupt operate. So choose one or the other. All right, so what, what is the difference between Series 1 and Series 2? Series 1 is the original, hence 1. Um, and they have slightly higher power consumption for the regular adapters, 50 amps, milliamps, I should say, uh, versus 40. Uh, they work out of the box, and they're not as complicated to set up. The Series 2 are what you need if you're going to do some true mesh networking. And one thing that makes them a little bit more complicated is that you have to actually load firmware, and you have to tell each modem hey, you're an end device, you're a router, you're a coordinator for a network. Um, and if you tell it, you, you might think, I'll just make everything a router. Well, then it's not allowed to sleep, right? Because routers aren't allowed to just save power and sleep, which could be a bad thing. Um, but if you're doing a larger pen test, you probably want to go with the Series 2. Okay? Series 1 is OK for your smaller tasks, but you know, especially if you have a large target. You know, maybe it's in a very big building and you want to be able to get all the places in the building, so you might want a series two for that. All right, so in the simplest case, if you have two XBs, um, you just configure them for your desired topology. And there's a, a software product called XCTU that only runs under Windows, but it runs great under Wine as well. So. Now, if you're running a Mac, you're out of luck, sorry. But, um, there's also another company that's made a compatible product that'll work, and I believe it does run on the, on the Mac. Um, but I, I don't like this much, but you can try it if you like. Um, okay, so how does this work? If you want to configure one of these XBs, you put them in a USB adapter, hook it up to your PC, run the software, um, select the correct port and set the baud rate correctly to communicate with it and out of the box it's going to default 9600 baud and you have to tell it to get the current configuration off the modem and then from there you can check it, it should say xb24 if it's a 2.4 gigahertz device and make sure it's set to the appropriate function set and then you have to give it what's called a, a pan id a personal area network id um, you know, it has a default value. If you want to be all cute, you can set it to something like 1337. Look at me, I'm an Uber hacker. Yeah. Of course, the only problem with something like that, if someone did detect it, they'd be like, okay, I know what this is. Um, and 
you have to give it a destination high and low address. And you can also do, there's like a longer addressing scheme, which I don't recommend, but um, you set it to one value for the destination, like if there's two of them, set one of them to zero, the other one to one, and just make sure you set the other one opposite, you write it to the XP module, and you're done. And this is just a screenshot showing you what the software looks like, and you can see at the bottom, there's a place to set up the addressing. All right, so in the simple case, you want to talk to a drum. You have just one drum. So you set up the adapters, as we just described, and you can set up TTY, or terminal device, on your drum, and you can use it any old terminal program from your laptop, netbook, whatever you want. Um, to log in, it's nice because it's simple and it allows you to do interactive programs. Um, how do you do that? You know, this shows you what you have to do on your uh, device. Basically, you just create this file, throw it in Etsy init, and it will just automatically start up, in my case, uh, TTY on device O2. That's not a zero by the way, it's O2 at 57 6 baud. And that's all you gotta do. Okay. You can start it up if it's not started already by using start TTY O2. Again, not a zero. Um, and you just connect. Alright. Slightly harder case if uh, this is what they call transparent mode. Transparent mode. So transparent mode is basically a wireless serial port. Right? So you connect it and you say, I'm talking to this guy, and everything just gets puked across that wireless link, just like it was a serial port. Right? So the slightly harder case, if you have more than one drone, you configure it, as I said, but you just change the addresses. Right? Uh, you can use the terminal program to connect again, and then you have to get into this AT mode. Now, some of you might be old enough to remember AT mode, AT commands for modems, and things like that, so this is basically the same thing. And uh, it's pretty simple. You go to the terminal program, you hit plus three times, and you wait, you don't press enter, you wait, it'll say okay, and then you send it some commands. So in this case, I sent it the command, please change your lower address byte to be two. So that I can talk to drone two. Uh, I sent the right command, ATWR, and then I sent it ATCN. Please exit command mode and start talking. Uh, I don't recommend that you use that transparent mode if you have more than, say, two drones. Uh, you probably want to use API mode. API mode is a lot more robust. Uh, things get set in packets, so you want to configure your stuff, again, with XCTU. And you can also uh, toggle a flag in order to tell it, hey, I'm going to use API. Um, and again, if it's a Series 2, you have to tell it, hey, it's an end device for a drone, or a controller, or a, a router, if that's what you're doing with some certain devices. And then you have different choices in how you talk to that, uh, to that device over XP. Uh, you can use this Java XP API, and you can use Python XP API, which is what I use because, you know, hackers. Java or Python, what's the hacker you're going to choose? Python. Um, so I was surprised that uh, fam uh, Family Feud, Hacker Feud, whatever it was yesterday, but that wasn't an answer, you know. What do pen testers use other than Metasploit? I, I'm surprised that nobody said Python. Maybe they're all click keys. <laughs> all right. So uh, you could, you know, if you want to be a, a, a lead, I'm sorry, a 1337 hacker with a 1337 pan ID, um, you could send raw stuff to your TTY device. You know, be a big uh, Pick one. 
Um, so again, if you have three or more drones, I definitely recommend that you go this way. Really, what you're doing with multiple droids, this is not really a mesh network if you're using Series 1. Uh, it's point to multi-point multi or star technology. Um, but to every drone, it looks like they're only talking to the controller. So it's pretty simple. And it does give you better performance. Uh, another little tip, by the way, um, make sure that all of the XBs are set to API mode because the little lights will flash saying that it's receiving stuff and you might sit there and go, what's wrong with my Python? Because it's not doing anything. Well, it's not doing anything because the modem rejected the packet because it wasn't a packet. It was just stream data. And they went, oh, this is just crap. And it threw it away. Now, if you want to do a larger pen test, you can, you know, you can hack, you can hack with large networks of devices. You need a dozen of these. Right, you could buy a dozen drones, less than 500 bucks, and hack the crap out of right. um, Or you can splurge, maybe spend a, a grand and attack, uh, attach a lot of things to those, but, or maybe an area drone. Right. Um, so yeah, you can configure them for mesh networking as well. Uh, and again, you have to use Series 2 adapters to do that. The thing that's cool is you don't have to change any of your scripts. Right? Your scripts don't care if it's Series 1 or Series 2. They just send stuff to that port and they're done. My network's a little slow. Um, so um, if you're doing that, you have to set at least one of them to be a coordinator. Again, that's not going to be able to go to sleep. Uh, you can also use routers to extend your range. Uh, if you're going to use a router, uh, it seems like a pro adapter would be better. I have a router that extends my range 300 feet or a mile, which you can choose. Um, so uh, you can also just power up a router with a battery. You don't have to connect it to a drone. And that's pretty easy to do. So let's talk about building some of this stuff. So you want to build a drone. Well, first of all, you have to get the deck. So here's a link. You can go over there. You can download this archive. And uh, if you're going to do XB, you probably want to download another module called the Mesh Deck. And it has all the Python scripting to do stuff and install scripts and such. Um, one thing I, I just wanted to note, when you download that, if you get the latest with Big Long Black, um, I cleaned out the apt cache because it was another 1.7 gig. And as I found out, my server is kind of slow when lots of people hit it. Um, I had you know, a couple of guys, especially a couple of guys from the UK, were really complaining. They're like, is your server down? It says it's 22 hours to finish my download. Like, uh, no, it's not. Um, sorry. Um, uh, other options, by the way, you can buy preloaded SD cards is a vendor I'll mention a little bit later. Um, there's a link at the bottom here um, if you don't want to deal with any of this. Uh, but buy yourself a micro SD card. Definitely buy a class 10. Don't cheap out and buy a class 6. And definitely don't get a check class 4. I mean, I know we're in West Michigan here. There's a lot of Dutch people here. You know, enough Dutch people you can take the census by rolling a penny down the street, right? <laughs> I can say that because I'm not. Uh, but uh, yeah, so you're going to need at least an 8 gig card. Get a class 10 card. Don't go cheap. Uh, extract the archive to your Linux box. There's a little setup script. It's very simple syntax. Set up SDSH, dash dash MMC, dev slash dev slash SD whatever, SDB or whatever your uh, card is set to be, dash you move ball. That's it. Sit back, wait a while, 20 to 30 minutes if you have a nice fast card. Um, it's 20 to 30 minutes because it's about 6 gigabytes. Right? Um, and then pop it in, and you're up. Pop it in, turn on the drone, and you're good to go. All right, so now you got to power this thing. Uh, there are a number of options. 
The, the Beagles take the standard 2.1 by 5.5 barrel connector. Uh, you need to have five volts or more. Anything above five volts is going to get wasted. This is like the world's simplest ghetto power supply, right? You get a 7805 linear uh, rectifier, a couple of capacitors, smooth stuff, a battery, and a plot. Right? And I, I know my, it looks like one, one of my kids drew this schematic. I apologize. Uh, uh, one thing to keep in mind now, if you're running the bare bones B1 block, there's nothing connected to it, uh, it'll run about 220 milliamps at 5 volts at 100% CPU. So, uh, my battery estimates are based on that. If you connect something like one of those LCD touch screens, you know, last year I brought my lunchbox. I brought it back so if anyone wants to play with it later. Um, that takes a lot of power. Right? So, just be aware of that. And um, if you can leech off someone's USB with a plantable, that's even better. Right? Uh, again, be careful with the Wi Fi stuff. You want to take advantage of sleep modes, and you don't want to get like a two watt alpha adapter at full power on 24 7 running on this thing. All right? That'd be really bad. Besides, by the way, those two watt alphas are crap. Don't buy them anyway. The watt one on some watts are good. Okay, uh, I got a little chart here that just kind of shows you how long can you get on batteries if you're using a couple of D cells, about 55 hours. Again, this is based on 100% CPU. Um, and if you're getting down to uh, using triple A's or 9 volt, uh, one 9 volt, about 6.8 hours. And again, this is another reason why they didn't use the pie. You know. um, anyone had any power issues with this? Right. Not as much, but yeah, Dave? Four. So basically four or six volts and then you drop it down to the 7805. So, um, and again, this is a typical D cell, typical alkaline D cell. Um, you know, you can get things like little USB rechargeable batteries and things like that. Uh, the white cable is just a USB cable. Of course, you can get AC adapters if you try to plug it in somewhere. Um, you got to build your Networking hardware, the 215 Ford hardware. And here I've got a couple of devices with XBs installed. You, uh, yes, sir. You could, yes. That, that should be fine. You know, if you're using the simple power circuit I showed, as long as you have above 5 volts going into that 7805 chip, you're good. In fact, uh, I, I have some power adapters that take two 9 volts, and that way you can like hot swap without uh, worrying about, oh, I'm sorry. Or you can put two batteries on it, and it'll last about twice as long, and still hot swap. All right, so um, you know, a couple of things you can do uh, for the 802.15.4. You probably want some sort of adapter. You can either get a USB adapter, which is really easy because you just plug it in, or a UART or serial adapter. Um, you can buy an adapter, like one from Adafruit, which is what I used here. Uh, you can also hopefully soon buy a cape for the BeagleBone uh, and BeagleBone Black that I intend on getting made so that you don't have to solder. USB, of course, is real easy. You should get at least one USB so you can program these things. All right, so how do you write, or how do you wire the XB? Well, if you bought USB, there's nothing to do. Um, there's four wires. You need 3.3 volts, ground, transmit, receive, and you also have to configure the BeagleBone. Um, and again, if you bought a cape, just plug it in. It's not out here, sorry. Um, and you have to set up this UR interface uh, for the BeagleBone. I'm using UR2. Uh, here I'm listing the pins that are used. And uh, in order to get it to work, again, we're using the, the latest kernel. It's a little bit different.
from the earlier kernels. Uh, the earlier kernels were, uh, had a different process where you just echo stuff to certain locations and it started working. And now they use something called a device tree, the device tree binaries, and device tree overlays. It's like the new way they do stuff in the kernel. I don't have time to go into that. But thankfully, if you're running the deck, all you have to do is echo that string, dbur2, into that file. And, well, um, create a file at ncrc.mobile before, you know, add this line before they exit zero. Don't add it at the end and go, gee, Phil, your stuff doesn't work. All right, Paul, well, has your script exited before it did anything? Um, so you echo that. I sleep for two seconds just to make sure everything's good and set up, and then I start up the mesh deck. All right, again, uh, capes. Make it easy. Cape is like an Arduino shield, but they call it a cape. It's not a big wound. Um, and for a cape, uh, I hope to have the XP capes out pretty soon. And I'm also working on an ultimate ponage cape that has an XP, has a network switch. So if you want to plug this sucker on the back of someone's computer, you can just plug it in line to their networking and a USB hub in case you've got a couple more USB devices that you want, and maybe 802.11 wireless. I'm trying to figure out if I can fit it on there or not. And I'm also looking at uh, the first version of the Air Deck has uh, the BeagleBone attached to it, but it's using the Transistor Robotics LEA board to fly the drone. I want to get rid of their board and I want to replace it with a beagle bone. Uh, so I'm hoping to sometime next year develop an air deck cape where you can just not buy their board, you just buy this cape, slap it on your beagle bone, and it'll fly you there, hack the crap out of somebody, and fly you home. That's the idea. Uh, other things you can do, uh, you can get some cool containers for all your stuff, like GI Joe backpack, Buzz Lightyear lunch boxes, which might have little packing or packing devices installed inside them. There, there we go. Um, if you want to plant something, again, this is a little network hub. And I'm leaching power off of USB. So I can just plug that in the back of someone's computer. Hopefully there'll be a nice little cape for that soon to make it even easier. All right. So the air deck. Let's talk about that. So you have the air deck and you want to build it. If you just want to extend the range, like let's say you've got a bunch of drones in the bushes outside of your target. You know, if you're getting real crazy, you might even get car batteries or motorcycle batteries, power these suckers. Find a big bush, big battery, little big little um, And if you just want to extend the range, you don't have to install a beagle bone at all. You can just plug in XP on there, configure this router, and you're good to go. Um, if you want to make a drone out of your quad shot, you're going to need a beagle black, a modem, uh, an XP cave, or you can do it yourself, an alpha adapter, a plug, and a nice short USB cable. And, you know, I'm going to skip over some of this because I know we started late, but, um, you know, as far as the air deck, basically version one, I installed all of this on the lid that covers this little LEA board in the bottom there. So, you know, here's the whole thing. All right, installs on the lid. So you want to start out by uh, using your BeagleBone black figure out where the holes should be, mark the holes with a big drill bit, take out the beagle bone black, don't drill through it, okay? Don't be stupid. All right. It might work out, it might not. Um, and do something similar. Uh, my alpha, I just took the innards out of an alpha, standard alpha that you all probably have used before. Put it inside again, mark the holes, remove 
little bit, drill the holes, and then put it back on. All right? uh, you can use 440 screws or something similar. Like if you're from the UK, you do that metric hardware stuff. I don't know what that's equivalent to, but something that fits through the hole. All right? uh, and again, another tip, especially for the Beagle Bone Black that's on the outside, you should have three nuts per screw, right? Because you get a screw, and you want a nut to hold that screw to the lid, and then two screws on the outside, right? One to lock the other, I'm sorry, not screws, nuts on the outside to lock it down, right? All right, and then you want to cut a couple of notches. I got a notch here for the power cable, and then a notch here for the USB cable. Uh, go buy a USB cable, a short one. You know, you guys live hopefully in a bigger town than I do, where you can actually buy stuff like this. I had to make my own, which was a real pain. Right? Um, and then you'll connect power. Can you just hold it up to the white contrast? Don't shake it around. Okay. Uh, a little lower. <laughs> <laughs> blurry. Yes. Okay, that's okay. People know what I look like. Um, all right, so, you know, you can just take all your stuff, and I also recommend you tie wrap it, right? Again, you don't want it to accidentally depart. Um, put it all together, install it on the lid, go forth and pump, all right? And when it's installed on the device, it looks kind of like that. Not surprising. Device, device. All right, kind of things you can do. Um, you know, simplest case, you can do some networks attack, attacks with just one drone. Uh, that allows you to hack from a distance. Again, if you're using the air deck, uh, it might not be practical to get in there. You know, maybe it's in a building with a big fence around it. So you gotta fly it in, park that sucker on the roof, right? Um, again, you can use the air deck just as a router to extend the range of your attack, or you can use it as a router and also as a um, pen testing device. Okay, so real quick, what kind of things can you do? Well, the mesh deck, I have some Python scripts that allow you to do simple things. So here on your command console, which could be any Linux box really, you can connect in and talk to your drones. And the way that works, if you're using API mode, um, every, there's a command window, and then one of these windows is for each drone. Right? So I'm getting responses from each drone, and I'm commanding controlling the drones as well. Right? So here I've got a very simple API. It says, hey, what do you want to send to drone one? And if I say colon three, that means I want to switch to drone three. And I send it commands and I can switch back and forth. I can get bulletins from my drones and regular command input and output as well. Okay. All right. We'll kind of skip ahead here a little bit uh, just because we're short on time. And again, uh, you can run just a router, and you don't need to add all of this stuff, and that's really simple. And that's a good thing. Um, you can use this as the only drone. You know, maybe you can't get to the bushes outside. Maybe you don't have any bushes, you know. Um, so that's another scenario. Um, you know, again, the best situation, you can fly this thing like an airplane, you can fly it like a quadcopter. So the best situation, you fly it to your target and land it on the roof and just leave it there. Right? Now, if you crash it because you're not really good at flying it, which honestly, I'm not really good at flying this sucker just yet, um, and you, you, land, you crash it on the roof, you can probably practice your social engineering skills. You're like, hey, I was flying my RC model. I'm really sorry, but I kind of crashed it on the roof. Do you think I can get it back? And most people wouldn't be terribly suspicious of, of your drone. So 
your mileage may vary. Again, at least it's a little cheaper than some of the alternatives. You know, you're looking at total total cost to build the whole device right now is 500 bucks. Uh, hopefully, when it, if I get the air deck cape, it'll be maybe like 400 bucks or something like that. Um, and of course, you can combine it with other drones and have some more fun. Uh, some future directions that I'm trying to go with this stuff. Uh, I'm going to continue to add stuff to the deck platform as the need arises. Um, do some more optimization for the beagle bones. And also, I'm currently working on optimizing and expanding the uh, XB code for things like simple file transfers. So let's say I want to send a new script to my drone. I can send it. Now again, it's 250K, right? So don't send like, hey, you know, well it is for you to want to or something. No, you don't want to do that. Um, but you could send some smaller stuff, uh, some other outputs. Um, also, uh, not specific to the air deck, but I'm looking at exploiting some of the USB on the go functionality. Some of you may have seen um, there is a, a lot of people doing stuff with the teenies and teensies, I guess, um, where they emulate a keyboard. Okay, they're doing that with like a 20 megahertz 8-bit processor. I got a gigahertz 32-bit ARM processor. Who's going to win that one? No. All right, so you can do a lot of fun stuff with that. Uh, and again, I'm trying to get rid of that Leo board. That Leo board is actually 200 bucks. So the whole thing is 400 bucks. And 200 bucks is on the, the little microcontroller board. Um, so I'm hoping I can replace that. Uh, also hoping to do some work. I've got a student working on some fun stuff with XB gateways. So I could pen test from across the world. The idea is you get the gateway that's maybe leeching off someone's free Wi-Fi and, and such within the mile range of your drones, and then you're transmitting to somewhere in the world. So instead of being by the pool down the street at the hotel, you could be in Tel Aviv. So. Uh, other things, uh, I'm kind of excited about this. I am writing a book about all this stuff, so a little plug for my blog, apologize for the plug. But, uh, Probably going to be called hacking and pen testing with low-power devices, but it's going to be all about how can you, you know, hack the crap out of people on battery power, you know, and for not a lot of money. Um, and the target is we're hoping that you'll be able to buy these by DEFCON 22 next summer. Um, and actually having to push, I had to push the publisher a little bit. Uh, they wanted to do the fall, and I'm like. How soon would I have to finish this book for you to get it up for DEF CON? So, uh, something to look forward to. Uh, here's some sources, so if you get the slides later, there's that. And we're almost back on time. So, if you have questions, come see me later. Um, I do have Air Deck, you can come see it. I also brought my lunch box and some other drones if you want to see all that stuff. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, Dave asked if I'm going to fly the drone, and the answer is not really, but I might uh, like fly it while I hold on to it because I don't want to hurt anyone. Um, you might notice I actually hurt myself with it, but uh, so yeah, I don't want that to happen to anybody else, and I'm sure the insurance people would not appreciate it, but I will probably cover